Are you ready to revolutionize your relationship with money? Welcome to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast with The Frugal Position, where Dr. Disha Spath will be your companion on this exciting financial adventure. Get ready to conquer debt, build wealth, and embrace a mindful spending lifestyle that will empower you to live life on your own terms. Pearson Rabbits' story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate ob at the height of her career. But then, a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery. Her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Stephanie became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Rabbits, Stephanie founded Pearson Rabbits, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Rabbits serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRabbits.com to schedule your consultation with a Pearson Rabbits advisor. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Finding Financial Freedom with a Frugal Physician. I'm your host, Dr. Disha Spath, and today we're diving into a truly fantastic topic with a very special guest. Joining us is Dr. Jordan Grumman, an accomplished physician and a visionary in the realm of financial independence and wellness. Born in the heart of Evanston, Illinois, in 1973, Dr. Grummet has journeyed from the University of Michigan to Northwestern University, where he earned his medical degree. Today, he brings his wealth of experience as the Associate Medical Director at Journey Care Hospice, but that's not all. Dr. Grummet is also the creative force behind the Earn and Invest podcast, an award-winning platform where he shares his insights on financial independence. His work hasn't gone unnoticed. In 2019, he earned the Plutus Award for the Best New Personal Finance Podcast and was a top contender for the Best Personal Finance Podcast in 2020. Our discussion today centers around his insightful book, Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. This book isn't just a guide to financial freedom. It's a powerful reminder from a hospice doctor's perspective about the essence of life wealth, and the avoidance of life's regrets. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Jordan Grummet to the show. Jordan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for the conversation. I am so honored to have you here. You've been in the personal finance circles for quite a while, and I've been following you, and you and I have similar stories, so I feel like I can really relate to you. You're an internal medicine doctor, right? Yes, I am. And I started in internal medicine and practiced almost every kind of internal medicine that's out there. So I did private practice. I worked for a medical group. I saw patients in the hospitals and the nursing homes and in my office. I kind of did it all. Wow. And then you went from being an internal medicine physician who had a very lucrative career, as I understand it, to going to a hospice palliative care position. Can you tell us a little about that? I did. So What happened is, as I was practicing internal medicine, I really loved it when I began, but I started getting more and more burned out. And I started realizing that I needed to find a financial way out because I didn't want to continue practicing forever. And I also started looking at government regulations and the way that doctors were charging and those kind of things. And it just, I figured something had to give. So I started looking at my finances and I had been originally as part of a medical group. And then I started in a private practice. And I liked my private practice, but I was spending a lot of time keeping two offices afloat. And really, I felt like I was using a lot of money for lots of staff and lots of office space. And I was seeing thousands of patients. And I realized that I could start my own concierge practice. And what I would do with that is I was seeing patients at home and I had a much, much smaller patient population, but I married that to a nursing home practice. And so I was seeing patients in their homes and then seeing nursing home patients. And it actually was very lucrative. And I was making a lot of money. And at the point where I got to maximal burnout, I realized that I was financially independent and I could think about leaving medicine and not necessarily need to make as much money anymore. 
as opposed to walking away completely, I started looking at what I was doing day to day. And I really questioned what has value, like what brings me joy? What do I really like doing? And I had happened to be doing hospice work almost as a side hustle. I was getting a stipend for managing a few teams on the side. And I realized that that was the part of my job I liked the most. So I started getting rid of everything else. And that was what I was left with. I got rid of nights. I got rid of weekends. And I just did what I liked most. And it ended up being a really part-time hospice gig where I was working 10 to 15 hours a week and then had the rest of the time to explore things that excited me and lit me up outside of medicine. Let's back up a little bit and tell me what attracted you to medicine in the first place. I mean, clearly you're a very talented doctor. You have a lot of experience in all the different realms of internal medicine and now hospice. What brought you to it in the first place? It's actually very difficult for me to talk about. And I talk about this in the book a little bit. I think I really became a doctor because my father died when I was eight years old and he was an oncologist and I wanted to be just like him. And I think cosmically, I felt like his death somehow was my fault because I was a little kid. And I think we all as little kids look at the world through our own lens of almost selfishness, right? We're self-absorbed. We're little. We don't know any different. When he died, I thought it was my fault. And I figured cosmically I could fix everything by becoming a doctor like him. And that became my sense of purpose and identity. And it really did serve me. I can't argue with this. I went and did become a doctor. And there was a lot of joy at one time. And I was very good at it. It's hard for me because it was the, probably the thing I'm most good at doing in the world. But it isn't the thing that brings me the maximal joy. This profession fit me and I was good at it but there was something lacking. And I think the burnout was a symptom not only of the difficulties of practicing medicine, which anyone who does this knows there's tons of difficulties, but it was also the frustration of realizing that there was something else I was meant to do and I wasn't addressing it. There was something else very purposeful for me and I was letting it go by the wayside. That sense of purpose is you know, something that you're going to be exploring further in your next book, I understand. But I can certainly relate with you from the child and wanting to live out the dreams of your parents' perspective. I, too, am a member of the Dead Dads Club. I lost mine at 10. And, you know, similarly, he was a pharmacist, but always wanted to become a doctor. And, you know, I knew from age five that that's what I wanted to do. And the journey evolves and medicine is difficult. You know, not only do you have to love practicing medicine, but then you also have to bear with what practicing medicine actually is in this day and age. And that's difficult. Finding joy in it is an active process, right? (laughs) Because you constantly have to put aside the annoyances and the drama. It sounds like you have found your way as far as hospice, palliative care medicine goes. I really enjoyed the message you had in your Taking Stock book. So I want to ask you, what motivated you to bridge the gap between traditional financial advice and living a regret-free life, particularly from the perspective of someone who really deals with end-of-life care and death quite a lot? One thing I realized is when I started to leave medicine, when I finally got the courage up and looked at my own finances and realized I could leave medicine and start doing what I really wanted to do in life, There was a pause where I was like, well, what do you really want to do in life? And it actually caused quite a bit of anxiety until I realized there were these things that I had always loved doing that I kept putting off because I was too busy being a doctor. Writing was one of them. Having these deep, important conversations, I realized this stuff really meant something to me. I was writing a medical blog. I had been doing it since 2004, but I never had enough time. And so I was doing it during nights and weekends and when the kids were asleep or when I had a small break. And I realized I never devoted as much time to this thing that I really loved. When I started seeing that I could step away from medicine, I started to spend more and more time doing that. And it was natural for me to think about finances because that was what gave me this freedom. So I started a financial blog and then eventually a financial podcast. And I was interviewing all these experts, these entrepreneurs, these real estate people. And my conversations naturally went from the 101, how do you get there? to the 201 of what comes next. And I found that we all had lots of questions. What does it all mean? What does enough look like in our lives? And strangely enough, I couldn't find the answers through all these financial people, but I started recognizing some of the answers in my hospice patients. Being told that they had a terminal illness and that life was going to be shorter and that they only had a certain amount of time left really opened their eyes to what was important and to what they regretted. And I started thinking about those regrets and how they related to the other side, the financial side. What if we had these epiphanies when we were much younger? What if we didn't wait until we were on our deathbeds, but could start having them younger 
when we had time, when we had energy, when we had all this wonderful gifts of maybe even being financially savvy. So we have this gift of also having some money around. What if we could start asking those important questions now? And that's why it seemed so important to bridge those two disparate worlds of mine. And I saw example after example after example of people in the hospice world who had a profound impact on the way I felt about the financial world. So one that I bring up all the time is this person who I call Ernesto in the book because I changed everyone's names. But Ernesto was a guy that in his 20s decided to leave work, take a sabbatical. He was in the prime of his career. He was moving up. He was doing a great job. And he did something no one else could understand. He took a sabbatical to go climb Mount Everest. And people told him he shouldn't do it. And he had to take a year off because he had to train for six months. And then he had to go there and do it and et cetera, et cetera. And he went actually to Mount Everest and he climbed about halfway up with his team. And then the weather changed and they actually never succeeded. He had to come back down. He went back to work. He continued his career. And then in his 40s, he got leukemia. And I took care of him as a hospice patient. And all the guy ever wanted to do was talk about trying to climb Mount Everest. I mean, he regaled us with all these stories, me and the hospice nurses and the chaplains. And I started thinking about this idea of how sad would he have been if he had put that off? If he had said, you know what? I'm too busy. My career is too important. I need to make lots of money. And then he had gotten to his 40s and got this diagnosis and never had the chance. And so I think a lot about that when I'm thinking about people and their finances and when they come to me and we talk about their plans and what they want to do with their money and they talk about how much they want to save and whether they want to YOLO now or not, right? You only live once. Do I want to take advantage of the moment or do I want to wait to the future? It's patients like those that really make me think about putting money in the right perspective. And that perspective is that we should be driven by things like purpose, identity, and connections. That's really winning the game. The money is a tool to help us have more of that. And so if money becomes a goal and it becomes the driving goal in our life and we start putting aside those important things like going to climb Mount Everest because we want to make more money, we've actually starting to look at it backwards. It's the other way around. Money should be the tool that helps us live out these important goals, which really have to do with our sense of purpose and our sense of identity and those people we're connected to in the world. And so there was just case after case where I was seeing these patients of mine who either regretted things they didn't do or were thankful for the things they did do. But often money had very little to do with it, except when money kept them from doing something that they would later regret. That's a very important perspective. I mean, especially in this personal finance, financial independence, retire early world, we often hear the message of, you know, save, save, save. It's all about your savings rate. It's all about your net worth. The less you spend, you know, think about the opportunity cost of everything you're buying and you could just put that in BTSAX and let it grow for a thousand years, you know, and look how rich you'll be. While that serves us, it does serve us. I'm not saying that's bad, especially early in our career where we develop those habits to save and invest. It shouldn't be the end goal. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about opportunity cost. And I call this the opportunity cost fallacy. We seem to think that money is the only thing that compounds, but we forget that other things compound. Our experiences, the things we do, sometimes even the things we buy compound into memories and skills and joy. Those are the dividends that get paid later on in life as we grow older. Those are the memories, right? So yes, when you decide to take that money out and take that trip to Hawaii, it is true that money can no longer compound. But that experience you had, let's say with your spouse or your children, or that time you went and saw that thing that was so important to you, that compounds in the form of memories, which also pay dividends, which takes us back to Ernesto. That's exactly what happened to him. The dividends for him were not monetary. It was that experience of trying to climb Mount Everest. And so I think it's a fallacy to think that money is the only thing that compounds and it's the only opportunity cost. You also miss out on life and you don't want to do that either. Right. Finding the balance and the sweet spot there is the hard part. You mentioned regrets that your patients had quite a lot. I'm interested to hear what are some common regrets that you've heard from your patients at the end of their life? Interestingly enough, they're all very different and also very similar. And what do I mean by that? Well, generally, the regrets tend to be that people never had the energy, courage, or time to do those things that were most important to them. So that's the commonality. 
where the differences come in is for everyone that's different, right? For one person, it might be not fixing or repairing that relationship that had gone awry. For another person, it might be not writing that book or not traveling to that country or not taking up that hobby. For everyone, it's different. But the commonality is the courage, right? The courage to forego what you're doing now, to step out of the habit that you formed and to go do that difficult, important thing. That's what I kept on seeing over and over again is looking back and saying, boy, I wish I had been more myself. I wish I had really pursued those things that were deeply important to me. What is the point where you say, I have enough now? We want to at least save a little, but then we also want to have these experiences. So what do you define as having enough for, say, financial independence, where you can really just kind of loosen the reins and go for it? So for me, enough has changed a lot, right? When I first got into financial independence, enough had everything to do with money. And that's because I thought money was the goal. As I started to realize that money is a tool that helps me live to something deeper and more important, really enough for me became purpose and identity and connections. And so when I look at my life, I realize, and I think it's true for all of us, Time is not a commodity. We can't exchange it. We can't trade it. We can't buy it. We can't sell it. Time passes no matter what we do, and it just passes. So I started thinking about enough is filling as much of that time as possible with purposeful activities that fill me up because that time is going to pass no matter what I do. The only control I have is what activities fill that time. Is it a continuum? Yes. Are there different levels of enough? Certainly. But it really became a climb to fill as much time as I could with meaningful activities. And so it changed. And so I started looking at money in a very different way. Money became the tool that allowed me to use my time in such a way. That's the way I think of money. So enough money is enough money that allows you to spend your days doing the things that are important to you. And that's going to be different from everyone. So if you love your job and you get paid well to do that job, then enough is actually not that much money right? It's enough really to pay for what you need to do so that you can go and show up to that job every day, but still come home and pay for your family and afford your house and do all those kind of things. I think we need to kind of take away or we have to disconnect money from enough and start putting it in perspective. It's just one of many tools. The FIRE movement really comes from a whole bunch of people trying to get away from the nine to five that they hate. But there are a lot of people out there that do like their jobs or would like it in smaller amounts. And in that situation, we don't have to race to FI. We don't have to race to financial independence or a certain number. Like you said, we could take our time and enjoy life. There are also a lot of people that are in a hole that need to climb out. And so you talk a little bit about front-loading those efforts and the different ways to achieve FIRE. Could you introduce us to those concepts? I really think there are three main ways to approach financial independence. And in the book, I talk about the parable of the three brothers, right? This idea that there are three brothers and they each embark on the path of a lifetime, but they go about it very differently. The first brother rushes forward, skips meals, skips sleep, and tries to get to the end of the path as fast as possible. At the end, they get there way faster than either the other two brothers, but they're exhausted. They've given a lot in order to get there and they can't get that back. The middle brother wants to finish the path just as fast as the first brother, but on some level, they don't have the stamina to do that. So they start out really strong, but then they get tired and have to take some breaks, some mini vacations, right? Some mini retirements. They need to take a step off of the path and relax for a while. Then they come back and slug it out again. They get there a little bit later than the first brother, but are a little bit less tired and have a little more energy to live life. And then finally, there's the youngest brother or the third brother does something very different. They love the path and enjoy every moment of being on that path. And when they get to the end of the road way later than either of the other brothers, they do something neither of the brothers can understand. They turn around and start back in the direction they came. And I really thought this was a really good parable for the different ways to get to financial independence. That first brother, the one who just runs at full speed until they get where they're going, is really that traditional fire path where we front load the sacrifice, we grind it out, We maybe take our purpose, identity, and connections, the whole winning the game, that big concept of what we're really fighting for, and we put it aside and say, well, we're going to live those things out, but we're going to wait until we have enough money to do it. We're going to sacrifice in the beginning. We're going to delay gratification. And for some people, that works really great. The sad thing is if you're like my or your father and you die young, 
you may die before you ever get to purpose, identity, and connections. And so that path doesn't work for everybody and not everyone has the stamina. So the path of the middle brother is more passive income or side hustles. These are the people who are willing to work really hard, but they need those breaks in the middle. And what they find is that by developing passive income or side hustles, they can get to the point where they make enough money to support their monthly needs, maybe in a year or two or three, as opposed to waiting the five or 10 years to front load the sacrifice. And then they can back off a little bit and maintain those income sources by not working as hard, but now they have a lot more time for purpose and identity and connections in their daily lives. And then finally, you've got the youngest brother who they may be working into the age of 70 or 75, but if they like their job, if they go for a passion play and enjoy what they're doing, they're actually financially independent from day one because they make enough money to cover their needs. And at the same time, they're living a life full of purpose, identity, and connection. So either way is fine. Front-loading the sacrifice, passive income or side hustles, or the passion play. They're just three different ways to look at financial independence. But as long as you can build up enough money to do the things that feel purposeful for you, you're kind of winning. So the question is, if you can figure out what's important and purposeful in your life, you then can decide which path fits you better and then start living that purpose today as opposed to waiting forever. That's such a powerful way. I love that you don't talk about net worth. I love that you don't talk about biggering and biggering and biggering your side hustle. So it's like a mega powerful company. You're talking about building just enough money to make the life we want to live possible. In your book, you discuss the art of subtraction as a way to get there. Please tell us a little bit more about that strategy and how it applies to your overall strategy. Well, for me, when I realized I was financially independent, I actually had a moment of real panic and anxiety because all I knew of purpose and identity was being a doctor. I knew nothing better. So I could have thrown the baby out with the bathwater and just stepped completely away from that identity, but I wasn't emotionally ready. I didn't even know what purpose could look like for me. So instead, I did something much easier. I looked at what I had. I looked at my current job. I looked at being a doctor and I said, well, let's get rid of what I don't like and see if there's anything left. And so I got rid of my private practice and I got rid of the nursing homes and I got rid of nights and weekends and I got rid of all of the things I didn't like. And I could do that because I was financially independent. And what I was left with was hospice. And that I realized I would do even if I wasn't being paid for it. And so I said, well, this is a part of work that still feels really purposeful for me. This is worth keeping. Now, granted, I was already financially independent. It was really easy. And people say, well, you have tons of money. Of course, it's easy for you to subtract what you don't like. But I think even when you're at the beginning of your trajectory and you don't have as much money, you need to start building margin in your life. You can do that in many different ways, but one way is to start looking at what you like in work and what you don't like at work and trying to get rid of those things you don't like and adding in things you like more. So even if you don't have any savings and even if you don't have much money available to you, you might realize that, hey, I really excel at these two or three things at work and I'm really bad at these other two or three things. How can I start shifting my career, even if I'm staying in the same job with the same people? How can I start shifting my career to do more of those things that feel purposeful to me and less of those things I don't? That might mean changing jobs. That might mean renegotiating in your current job. That might mean developing a side hustle so that you can back off and work part time. All of those things are possible. But if you don't start thinking about subtraction now, what are those friction points in your life? How can we minimize those? Because again, you only have a certain amount of time on this world. And all you can do is start controlling how you fill that time. And so that means looking at things like your job and getting rid of those things that bring you friction and adding in those things that bring you joy. So I talk about the art of subtraction in this book. In my next book, I actually talk about the joy of addition. So not only do you have to subtract what you don't like, but then you have to start adding in joyful things or things that give you a sense of purpose. And when all else fails, you always have substitution. So if you can't add in things you like, and if you can't subtract things you don't like, you can always try switching jobs or working for a different boss or trying a different field. All of those things are possibilities. So how can we use those concepts to change our daily lives regardless of our net worth? So you said, you like how I don't talk about net worth. The reason why is I don't want you to feel like if you don't have net worth, you can't do these things. These things I believe are in your power even when you're at your most meager place financially. It's just being really intentional about how you want to live your life. Yeah, I think that's the gift of experiencing death at an early age. 
that you know that life is limited. And while it's important to have financial stability, it's very, very important to make the best of every moment we have. People don't realize, and I talk about this a lot, like when you're my age, you have a lot of the tool of money if you've been really careful. But you know what I don't have? What I had when I was 20 and had very little money? I don't have nearly as much energy. When I was 20, I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. I didn't have a mortgage. So I had a bunch of tools back then that I don't have now. But I didn't necessarily recognize that. So part of what I try to really teach young people is to start recognizing their tools. You are 25 years old. Your energy level is going to be higher than mine. You might be able to work on a side project on any given weekend day, and it may not stress you out that much. Whereas me in my life with my mortgage and my kids and my other things going on, I may not have the energy to do that. So that's a tool you have, even if you don't have a huge net worth. So given your background as a hospice doctor, please tell us how we can address the financial and life planning aspects that people may overlook, especially when considering end of life scenarios. Yeah, I think we do a really bad job of thinking about our financial planning at end of life. And in the book, I talk about your important medical legacy documents and your important financial legacy documents. And I kind of go through that. And we in healthcare, we're very familiar, especially with the medical legacy documents, the things like the medical power of attorney and advanced directives. And these are all important things I think we need to address and think about. And nowadays we talk about the post form physician orders of life sustaining treatment. So if you were to get very ill, what things would you want done or not done? And those are all things that we can start working on when we're young and start planning for now to get our financial house in order, as well as our parents' financial house in order, if we still have parents who are living, because their medical dramas can turn into financial dramas, which can affect us as well as them. So that's one side is those medical legacy documents, but then their financial legacy documents, things like the financial power of attorney. We often forget that, for instance, our parents, if they're not able to make financial decisions and there is no financial power of attorney, we actually would have to go to court in order to gain that right to help them. And that can be very costly and very cumbersome. So thinking about such things much earlier is important, again, not only for our own financial house, but for that of our parents and our kids, et cetera. I think we need to put a lot of thought into that. And I spend a chapter in the book talking about that, which is more detailed, but I think we have to start thinking about those things now. And those kind of moments don't come back you can't talk about these things when you are at the end of life. Going back to, you know, identity, purpose, and connection, having these documents in place, make sure that money doesn't come in the way of the most important people in your life. Yeah. And if you think about it, like, it's more than just money. As we get older, we actually have a legacy to leave our children and our children's children. A big part of doing this financial planning, because no one likes doing it, no one likes doing estate planning, and many people in our age group, which is kind of getting towards middle age, have trouble talking about this with our parents. But ideally, you want to talk to your parents about what kind of legacy do you want to leave? And that includes everything like their stories and their beliefs and their hobbies and their joys. But it also includes, you know, that summer house on the lake and all those kind of things, too. Your money is one part of the legacy, but you want to make sure that when they do, God forbid, pass away, that that legacy is secure, that their loved ones continue to remember them for years and years after. And that's what we kind of want to elucidate now while they can talk about these things so that we can make sure that they last in the hearts and minds of their loved ones long after they're gone. And that's a great conversation to have with ourselves right now as well, right? What kind of legacy do I want to leave? A lot of us leave giving till the end of life. Other people, you know, give as they go because it gives them joy or purpose and meaning. And, you know, those are the kind of decisions we need to make as we're going along. And then really thinking about, you know, am I the kind of person that wants to die with zero and not leave anything? Or do I want to leave something for my kids? Or if they get something, then great. Or, you know, if I don't make it, then <laughs> all my assets go somewhere. It's important to have those conversations. And that's, again, goes back to really designing life to lead to your own happiness and purpose and meaning and create those connections and make sure they sustain themselves throughout time and after your time. And one of the big things, this brings me back to purpose, identity, and connections. We talk about our finances, we talk about our hopes and dreams and stories, but actually one of the things I think that is incredibly generationally impactful is when your family sees you engaged in things that are purposeful, 
those are the kind of stories and things that carry on from generation to generation. In my next book, I actually tell the story of my grandfather who I never met. My mother's father loved math. And so my mom growing up would see him engaged. She was an accountant and she would see him engaged in doing the accounting and he'd have his spreadsheets. And as a little girl, she'd sit on his lap and he would teach her about the spreadsheets. And because she saw him doing something that was deeply purposeful for him, she, of course, tried on that identity herself, right? And so she, as a kid, said, hmm, he loves math. She developed a love for math and became an accountant. When I was a kid, I had a learning disability and I had a lot of trouble learning how to read. But the one thing that kind of saved me is I was excellent at math because I had watched my mom who loved math and I had taken to math and then I saw I was good at it. And I eventually went into medicine, which is a highly mathematical field. I think about this idea, my grandfather, who I never met, more than any monetary legacy he left, he left this generational growth, this love of math that passed on to my mom, which passed on to me, which not only helped me at a time that was very difficult for me when I had a learning disability, but also became the backbone of what I did for a living being a doctor. And then I went into financial independence. And you know, financial independence is all about math. All of this from a grandfather I never even met. And so when we really talk about legacy, it's all of it, right? It's the finances, but it's also who we are. And it's us pursuing our purpose now that actually creates that legacy far, far into the future. Oh, that's so wise. It's so true. I mean, so many kids, I'm sure we all know so many people that have only seen their pa parents kind of grind it out, right? But it is so powerful when you see your parents enjoying themselves, right? Doing something fun. And it's so impactful to leave that legacy of joy and purpose to our children. I know I've taken up a lot of your time and I'm so, so glad <laughs> that you took the time to come and talk with us. Are there any of the last pieces of advice you'd like to leave with our listeners? Yeah, really the backbone of the book is based on three principles. The first principle is we should be thinking about purpose and identity and connections first before we think about finances. That doesn't mean we forget our finances, but I tell people, put your finances on hold for a moment and really think deeply about purpose, identity, and connections. That's step one. Step two is once you have a sense of what feels like purpose in your life, then to build a financial framework around it. That's where we get into the three brothers and this idea of how do we want to build a financial life. And then the last and third most important step is we're all stuck, regardless of knowing what our sense of purpose is and regardless of knowing which brother we are and what our path to financial independence is. We're still stuck day to day with the very difficult decision of do I spend today or do I defer gratification towards tomorrow? And so that's a really tough question because you could, God forbid, be like my father or your father, die young. And if you don't spend a little today, you may miss out or never enjoy that wealth. On the other hand, if you're not careful today and don't defer gratification, you may not be able to live out that wonderful retirement that we're all planning. So a key to that, I always tell people, is if we knew when we were going to die, if we knew the day and the year, we could plan it out perfectly and do exactly what you were talking about, die with zero. The problem is we don't know when we're going to die. So the best proxy, in my opinion, is to ask yourself a real important question. Are you afraid of dying young and never enjoying your wealth? Or are you more afraid of dying old and running out of money? And so if you can ask yourself that question, you can start to see where your values lie. And then you can build a life around it. So if you're worried that you are going to die young and not enjoy your wealth, and this was actually my father because he actually thought he was going to die young. So what you do then is you actually do a little more YOLO. You spend money on things you love. You take more vacations. You have more hobbies. You put a little bit less away for retirement. I'm not saying you put zero to retirement, but maybe you only put 10 or 15% away for retirement. And if you're right and you die young, then you lived a great life. If you're wrong and you live to an old age, you might have to work into your 70s, but you're taking great vacations and doing things you love and really using your money to bring you joy. That's also winning. Now, if you flip it the other way and you say, well, I'm really afraid. I'm not afraid of not using my wealth. I'm afraid of dying old and running out of money. If that's the case, then you do want to probably save more and work harder now and defer gratification more. Maybe you only YOLO with 10% of your money and then you put 50% away. And then maybe you retire at 50 or 55 and really get to enjoy yourself afterwards. Now, if you are correct and you live long, then you're going to have a great period of post-retirement where you get to do whatever you want. Now, if you're wrong, this is the one bad of all four scenarios. If you're wrong, 
and die young, you die young while you're kind of in the midst of grinding it out, but at least you're spending some money towards things you like doing, some money towards YOLO. And so I think if you can ask yourself that question, and that's that third piece of the puzzle of this book, that's a really good way to decide of the continuum of YOLO versus deferred gratification. How much do I spend now versus how much do I put away into retirement accounts? I'd like to suggest some alternatives, too. I mean, you talk about this in your book. You talk about Coast Fire, right, where you put in like a concentrated amount of money or time and effort early on. That's kind of what Josh and I did, like two or three years of deferred gratification. And then after that, you're set and you kind of coast to the end after that because you have enough of a delta built in just from your habits and you're saving enough and you know you're saving enough and then you have fun with the rest of it. But you put in a concentrated bit of time in the beginning where you're just putting a lot away and digging out of the hole. And so that's the live like a resident mentality, right? That works as well. And I do want to mention that it's not always having to choose between travel and not travel or spending money. We can choose to travel cheaply, right? When I was a kid in college, I did a month in the Amazon. I lived in the Amazon with a tribe. It was cheap for me. It actually made money doing it because I got scholarships. But you can find a way to make that thing that you want to do happen. My parents couldn't pay for a trip to Europe. So I went to the Amazon <laughs> with a scholarship. And it was the most impactful experience by far that I've had. And even now, you know, with kids, we can travel with points. You don't have to stay at five-star hotels. You can stay at the three-star hotel and pay for it with points. So it's completely possible to have it all. <laughs> you just have to be a little bit mindful about that and ask yourself the important questions that Dr. Grummet is telling you to ask yourself, right? Which is, what is your identity? What is your purpose? And what connections do you really want to focus on in your life so that you create the legacy that you want to leave? Well, Dr. Grummet, thank you so much. It's really such a pleasure to have you on. These important questions are the reason I have this podcast, because it is important to sit down and just think about the bigger picture every once in a while so that we really get the results we want out of life. So thank you again. And we hope to have you back at some point. And good luck with your next book. I'm sure it's going to be fabulous. If you guys haven't checked out Dr. Grummet's book, please go and read it. It's on Audible, it's in print, and now it's going to be available in other countries as well. It has actually been translated and published in mainland China, and we just signed a deal for Taiwan. So it's going to be retranslated there too. So Amazing. And what other places can they find you if they want to connect with you? So the easiest way is to go to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you can see, obviously, how to get the book, but also there are three main ways I've produced content in the past and present. One is a medical blog called In My Humble Opinion. You can find the link there. I did that from about 2004 to 2018. There's a financial blog called diversify.com. And last but not least, where I spend most of my time today is the Earn and Invest podcast, which you can also find the link there. As we wrap up today's episode, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Jordan Grummet for joining us and sharing such invaluable insights. Jordan, your journey and your words are a beacon of inspiration for all of us seeking financial freedom and a life rich with meaning and devoid of regrets. To our listeners, I hope today's conversation has given you a new perspective on wealth, life, and the importance of taking stock of what truly matters. Remember, it's never too late to start on the path to financial independence and a regret-free life. You can find Dr. Grummet's book, Taking Stock, at major bookstores and online. For more wisdom and insights, be sure to check out the Earn and Invest podcast and connect with Jordan on social media. In other news, the IDR waiver deadline was recently extended. So if you haven't consolidated your loans, if you're pursuing IDR forgiveness or PSLF, you have a little bit more time. So that is very encouraging for those with student loans. The IDR waiver deadline for consolidation has been extended to April 30th, 2024. So if you haven't done it, go ahead and look into that. It can be very beneficial to those who have been paying on their student loans for a while. Now, a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit www.pearsonrabbits.com today and embark on your journey to safeguarding your future. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Finding Financial Freedom with the Frugal Physician. 
I'm Dr. Disha Spath, and I encourage you to reflect on your own financial journey to cherish every moment of this beautiful life. Join us next time for more insights on living your best financial and actual life. Until then, stay frugal, y'all. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisors, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.